During our high-level panel this morning, we heard more than once the importance of investing and scaling, scaling up investments in nature-based solutions. Well, now I have the pleasure of connecting with two experts to talk about the Newton Fund, which finances science partnerships for green and sustainable innovation. Dr. Stephanie Renford is Science Advisor at the British Council since 2016, where she supports science and research programs that are funded through official development assistance. One of those programs is the Newton Fund indeed, which aims to build innovation partnerships with countries in, in Africa, in Asia and Latin America to support economic development and social welfare. Stephanie is joining us today from Edinburgh in Scotland. A very warm welcome, Stephanie. And my second expert is Richard Haig, Professor of Disaster Resilience at the University of Huddersfield's Global Disaster Resilience Center, which is a multidisciplinary team of researchers who work both in the UK and internationally to tackle disaster risk. The team of Professor Haig aims to develop new knowledge that can build the resilience of communities to a range of hazards, such as flooding, earthquakes, but also pandemics. Thank you for joining, Professor. Uh, Stephanie, I will start with you, if I may. Uh, could you perhaps tell us a bit more about the British Council and the Newton Fund? Thank you for the question, Philip. Um, so the British Council connects people around the world through arts, education and uh, the English language to address shared global challenges. And in science and research, we particularly use our programs to build research collaborations that can help to create sustainable relationships and partnerships between the UK and other countries. And we are very proud to be a delivery partner under the Newton Fund, um, which you already mentioned. Um, and the Newton Fund really is a program that brings together researchers and institutions from the UK and low and middle income countries to collaborate and find solutions to most pressing developmental challenges. And um, the Newton Fund, I, need, uh, I should say, that is managed by the UK's Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. But all of the projects that are funded under the Newton Fund are match funded through um, local partners and national funding agencies. And here at EDD21, we are very proud to be showcasing two award-winning research projects under the Newton Fund. Both projects have won the uh, prestigious Newton Prize, which is a prize that recognizes pioneering research and innovations that come specifically from these international partnerships. And one of the projects that we are showcasing at, at our stand is a collaboration between researchers in the UK and Colombia, and that team has discovered new ways to turn coffee waste into electricity. And the second project that we are um, showcasing at our stand is a UK-Indonesia research collaboration. And you'll hear about that from um, Professor Haig uh, in a minute. And this project really explores how coastal communities in Indonesia can be protected from the impact of climate change. Okay, thank you so much for bringing that to the attention, uh, Stephanie. Indeed, I'd like to turn to Richard, maybe. I, I do have a question on your Newton Fund research project in protecting coastal communities from the impacts of climate change. And um, What type of challenges are those communities facing? And could you perhaps elaborate on how you are addressing those uh, through your research? Good morning, Philippe. And uh, with the support of the British Council and the UK Newton Fund, we've been working to help address the threat posed by tsunami, um, especially to coastal communities in Indonesia, but also uh, other countries surrounding the Indian Ocean. And the reason for this is that around the world, tsunami threat remains high, and scientists have warned that climate change can result in more frequent and severe tsunamis. So for example, due to the impacts of sea level rise. Now, in a country like uh, Indonesia, the disaster risk index for tsunami is the highest of all hazards. And this is because although they are relatively infrequent events, they're also potentially some of the most devastating. It's therefore vital that we help to protect some of the estimated 800 million people that live in coastal areas um, around the, the, the 28 countries um, in, the, in the Indian Ocean. 
So limitations uh, in preparedness and early warning were exposed again, actually, by the, the two tsunami events that some of you may recall uh, that took place in Indonesia in 2018. And they killed thousands of people, destroyed a lot of buildings and infrastructure. Uh, and, and these events have again highlighted the need to, to build capacity to address tsunami and other coastal hazards, including multi-hazard threats uh, and cascading uh, threats, to, such as landslides and liquefaction that often occur at the same time. So our, our research is addressing the challenge specifically of how to ensure dissemination of effective tsunami warning messages and to improve the preparedness of communities to respond to those warnings. Now, the, prom the, the problem is actually very complex because there's a wide array of different uh, agencies and actors involved. Uh, there's variations in human and technical capacities across the countries in the Indian Ocean. And there are different legal frameworks and, and cultural factors that we also need to consider. So, for example, we've been mapping the, the relationship between different agencies in the dissemination of early warning, um, and that, that will help to inform better coordination of these actors. Uh, we've also been looking at the barriers and the enablers for the next generation of tsunami early warning technology, uh, such as that link to the fifth generation of wireless communications, or 5G as it's more commonly known. Um, I think we've also seen with the current pandemic um, that this has emphasised the need to continually update tsunami early warning systems so that they can be effective under developing constraints. So social distancing measures, stay-at-home orders that we've seen introduced around the world, um, they can also impact uh, you know, the, the early warning uh, response as well if there was a, to be a tsunami event in those circumstances. So our work has been supporting the development of a more multi-hazard approach to early warning that can deal with this type of, of concurrent threat. Thank you, uh, Richard. And indeed, I'm a bit humbled to hear that your research touches upon the lives of more than 800 million people. Uh, we have a couple of minutes left in our interview, so I'd like to turn to you, Stephanie. Uh, that maybe you can quickly explain the outcomes of such partnerships, such as Professor Hayes just explained, and also the tangible impact of those projects. Yes, thank you. So, so all of the projects that have received funding under the Newton Fund, including Professor Hakes, um, are usually addressing one or even more of the sustainable development goals. And this really helps with poverty reduction, for example, through promoting social inclusion, um, through helping with economic growth in the partner countries we work with, and um, ensuring that there is um, environmental sustainability um, in the, the partner countries. Um, um, the projects also have an impact on cultural relations. So when people, um, in that case researchers or scientists, collaborate across borders as part of a project, um, one of the uh, good side benefits is that they usually develop a deeper understanding between people of different cultures and backgrounds. And, and that can, and we see that a lot in, in many projects, that really can support trust, um, in some cases peace, um, political decision making, even diplomatic progress um, between um, the, the partner countries, and I think this this is this is really important. So it doesn't only connect individuals, but it connects communities, um, and it connects you know funders, policymakers at, at a higher level as well. And um, speaking of connection, so connection is really something that is at the heart of what we do at, at the British Council, connecting people from different countries all around the world. And we do that through programmes like the Newton Fund, but also through other initiatives. And I just wanted to highlight that we've recently launched our Global Climate connection program and campaign, which really aims to bring together young people from all around the world to discuss climate change. And that is something that we're specifically doing um, in the context of the Conference of the Parties, the COP26, um, which will take place in, in Glasgow this year. And um, yeah, is it, it's a new initiative. And we'd really welcome visitors to our stand in the Global Village 
um, if people would like to find out more about the Newton Fund indeed, but also about the Climate Connection, um, please come and, and visit us in the Global Village. A very good idea indeed, Stephanie. Thanks for bringing that to the attention. And indeed, I'm glad to see that the Newton Fund is connecting dots and building bridges. In light of timing, I need to wrap up the interview here, but thanks a lot, Dr. Stephanie Renford from the British Council and Professor Richard Haig from the University of Huddersfield. That brings us at the end of the first session and the start of a 10-minute break. We do have a lot more up our sleeves, so please either stay connected or rejoin this channel in 10 minutes. Do take the opportunity for this break to uh, explore the networking opportunities or visit indeed the virtual stands on our EDD platform. I was also very happy to hear from Stephanie that the Newton Fund has supported a project in Colombia that transforms coffee waste into electricity. That will help our audience to stay powered up even if we run out of coffee. So I'll see you again in 10 minutes in 1010 minutes on this channel too. Thank you and see you soon.